From In the Beginning to the Musical Apocalypse, this is The Bible Says What. I'm your host, Mike Wiseman. There's a lot I don't understand or fully comprehend. I'm okay with that. I accept my ignorance about a great many things, and I work towards a better understanding. That is how I grow as a person. Yahweh, on the other hand, claims to be all-knowing in 1 John 3.20, yet throughout the Bible we find blatant examples of the opposite. In Leviticus 15.19-31, Yahweh fails to know what a woman's monthly cycle is. The all-knowing Christian deity thinks period blood contains a highly contagious form of the cooties that can easily be spread to a whole town if precautions are not taken. According to Genesis 11.5, the Christian deity did not know what was going on in the city of Sodom. He needed to go down and take a look to see if what he had heard was true. In the book of Job, Yahweh failed to know where his arch nemesis had been, after which he was unable to realize in time that the devil had tricked him into killing innocent people. Job 2.3 In Genesis 22, the all-knowing Christian deity failed to know how dedicated to the cause his friend Abraham was. Yahweh decided the best way for his friend to prove his loyalty was for him to murder his son. Abraham obliged and almost slaughtered his kid as a sacrifice to his loving deity. One of the more obvious things Yahweh failed to realize that his promotion and condoning of slavery was wrong. In the New Testament, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 5, we find that Yahweh commands slaves to obey their masters with respect and fear. He finds these monsters to be deserving of the same level of honor shown to the Christian demigod. The Christian deity clearly has no issue with owning people as property. These are not the demands of a compassionate, all-knowing being. When a Christian is unable to understand why their loving deity would condone such a despicable act, most do not refute or question him. Instead, they come up with excuses for these inhumane demands from their perfect deity. They have to make the really bad stuff sound better and less harsh in some way. They have to turn their deity's disgusting policies and commands into something palatable. These kinds of ideas need to be challenged and confronted, not shrugged off, watered down, or brushed under the rug. These issues need to be brought into the light and exposed for the disgusting ideas they are. Christians worship a being that is a documented advocate for the enslavement of human beings. Why would anyone want to worship such a monster? Let's start the show. Is there anything in the Bible that you yourself have an issue with? <laughs> Okay, so it took you reading the Bible to realize that those things were bad for you? Yeah, it actually did. I, I didn't figure I, this out on your own? No, Ted, Ted Bundy could be redeemed. God doesn't kill children. Does, what, what do you think the Passover was? Yahweh sets up a whole system in the Old Testament where you slaughter animals just so he's able to forgive you. Today's special guest is the YouTube sensation, reformed Christian apologist. Welcome to the show, RC. Hey, what's up? Thank you for having me, man. Oh, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. So why don't you tell the guest briefly about uh, a little bit about what you do? Uh, well, I... Um have been doing Christian apologetics for a few years now. It's uh, mostly just me going online in which I either engage in debates. I've been in about 45 formal moderated debates, including um, one with uh, R and Ra, I think would have been the considered the big highlight there. And I've been in several mm -hmm. with a godless engineer on uh, YouTube as well. Um, mostly it's just been uh, the debates plus the podcast, theological discussion, which we have every Thursday, um, at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. And then there's also going about uh, making original content, if I could. It's been a while since we've done it. Um, I would use like an anime kind of format that I made with Renmaru Games uh, uh, app. And then as well as recently been publishing a apologetics quarterly that goes over various different topics we posted a while back on why Christianity, which is the first issue and currently in the work of the issue, uh, engaging with the black Hebrew Israelite cult 
and um, going refuting the claims that are usually made about them. <laughs> you sound pretty busy. I tried to be. <laughs> All right, well, let's jump right in. What is the Bible to you, sir? I would say to me that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, that it is uh, God's uh, written Word revealed unto man through the Old Testament during the pro- to the prophets of the time, and then to the New Testament, which is revealed unto the apostles or the disciples to the apostles, not in the sense of like he wrote, had this already written down since that's sort of Quranic theology, but rather that it's the uh, men who are inspired by God in the sense that they have the spirit with them and the men are then writing and writing down what they have uh, from their experience with the spirit. Interesting. So second Timothy three sixteen, all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, preaching, correcting, training, all that stuff that you, yeah. you fall into that. Yes, I would fall for that, fall into that, and the 17 that says that the man of God may be complete, equipped uh, hmm. for every good work. Yes. Gotcha. So the Bible is um, some kind of holy um, manual for life, right? In a sense, because there are books and passages that would go into that, but at the same time, there's other passages that aren't necessarily for that, like with a lot of the Old Testament, for for example, and then Acts. Um, most of this is like a historical thing. While there could be even some good teachings or benefits from some of these passages, we have to keep in mind that the context is that this was not a book written to us, um, but rather it was written for us. Um, that's the old saying by John Walton goes that there is essentially uh, a text that was written to for the Old Testament, the ancient Israelites. Mm-hmm. That was the audience of whom it was written to. And then the New Testament would have been the church or the if you go to the Gospels, depending on which one you use, you have different contexts of who's being addressed there. But as we can look at that, we can also see it as written for us in the sense that we have the ability to have this word and then to study upon it, but we can't just simply read it as if it was written to a 21st century American or Canadian or British or whatever kind of context you're reading it from at the time. You have to understand it in the context of which it, who it was written to, because that's, well, who it was written to. Right. Well, I mean, I understand context and whatnot, but at the same time, these are laws, these are ideas that Yahweh had. Uh, uh, you say inspired. How, how do you visual or how do you um, how do you work that out? Inspired? Did he tell them to write this down? Did he give them like little feelings of this might be the right thing? Little gut feelings, you know? How, how does that work for you? Well, inspired is certainly a very complicated uh, subject. It's one I've been struggling with because what I mostly hold to is sort of the kind of position regarding inspiration and inerrancy that a uh, Dr. Michael Heiser would affirm in the sense that what you have is scripture, if we're talking about inspiration, that like I said earlier, they have the Holy Spirit in them Hmm. and doesn't mean that therefore then there's a dictation regarding what is being written down. But instead, it's the fact that these are people who are uh, being utilized by God as prophets or apostles or even the companions thereof of the apostles, and they are writing down Scripture um, through their experience, meaning that it's not from some divine experience that they necessarily are uh, writing the stuff from. But it's hmm. sometimes even from their own personal experience. That's why we can sort of see some sort of fallible language that is utilized in the Bible sometimes regarding uh, cosmology and regarding other issues because they're mostly going off of their observations. Hence, what Hmm. science was in the beginning stages for them, they go off the observations, and hence you have sort of a geocentric view of uh, the universe. You have a sort of flat-earth kind of cosmology over certain things. Like the firmament. Correct, yes. That's all just added stuff, you believe. I don't believe it's added stuff. actually God-inspired. I believe it's God inspired, but that God is able to utilize um, the their and, understanding. And the so, so yeah, right, Yahweh is using their across. their their um, inability to understand the world around them to teach them mm-hmm. lessons. Correct, and that is the issue of the lesson being God and who He is, and trying to bring people in reconciliation with Him in the covenant. Uh, that they have, and hence why Israel is placed into that covenant versus the other nations and anyone else that was wanted to be involved. There could be a sort of grafting in 
um, but wouldn't have been necessarily the same kind of benefits that Israel had gotten in terms of the relationship, but they would still be able to be um, given some of those same kind of privileges, and especially um, in terms of their standing with God. What privileges? What do you mean privileges? Well, for example, the issue of where they are, for example, remember that the Israelites were enslaved, were bondage uh, to... Debatable. Uh, in terms of the Egyptian, there is um, historical evidence, evidence that there is shows there that is historical debatable. evidence for there is historical evidence for the issue is how big was say the Exodus or was how it, many was people were people in or Egypt five hundred or millions I mean it doesn't right and, you, I, and you there's a good book sure. from a and there's a good book by a I think is a Richard a, a Friedman I forget what his uh, name is I know he did a book a while back called Who Wrote the Bible and then he recently did oh, a yeah. book That's on a the Exodus who um, covers the same thing and he's from what I even seen in his lecture he gave uh, convinced of what would be considered the, like the minority kind of uh, view of the exodus that it was an exodus that happened but it was very small and thus sort right. of impossible if it took place, to it trace was be small right so right. the and bible so, got it wrong is what you're saying right not necessarily because i can even go with the issue of allowing and there's been scholars that have been going on to this that there is even within the exodus um room in the book of Exodus and then elsewhere within the text that there could be allowing for that particular uh, small amount of people. And plus, even if we do go with the idea that there was a big type of Exodus. It I mean, seems like it's a pretty big Exodus in the Bible, man. And then Yahweh wants to be praised and worshipped for it throughout. He's like, remember when I saved you from Egypt? Don't forget. Don't mm -hmm. forget. Yeah. Right. No. <laughs> I don't know, man. It's uh, it's a debatable, of course. It's a good, it's a good, mm -hmm. uh, good debate. Right. Uh, so, so you think the exodus happened? Do you think it was a lot of people or a little bit of people? I'm in the moment kind of agnostic on that. I don't think that either way, regarding the particular amount of people, that it would negate the fact that there was an exodus period uh, at that. So that's the minimal I'm going on. But in terms of what the exact number is, I'm still within my research uh, studies on that. Gotcha. So, so do you believe that the events that it describes the plagues and, and the fleeing and all that, all that took place. Do you believe any of that's real or exaggerated or how do you decipher that? I would believe that it's real and not just simply based on the biblical text, but even from what I had read, there have been people that have written down on tablets mm -hmm. and inscriptions within the area that that's what they experienced. They experienced these particular kinds of plagues mm -hmm. and we're not talking about like from royalty kind of people, but rather that it was just people that were living in Egypt at the time doing their own particular thing. And they would notice these plagues and would either start having some kind of questionable doubts as to what is the cause of it. Or some people make up their own idea saying that maybe this was their particular own God cursing them for something that they did. They had all kinds of theories as to why these were coming about. But none of the them, plagues were mentioned. None of them mention Aaron or Moses or Yahweh. Correct, because not everyone was involved with the knowledge of Aaron or Moses or trying to get involved in them. I don't think, like mm. some people try to make it that the entirety of Egypt is out to get Moses or Aaron well, the, or anything the story, like that. The story goes that Yahweh did this so that everybody would know he's God mm -hmm. and know how powerful he is. He was doing it to show off his powers, uh, Exodus 9.16, I believe it is. Uh, Correct. So not everybody knew he failed. Not necessarily, because the issue is not trying to get like every single person to know about him in Generation. regards to the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what that's what well one of his goals was during this whole thing. That's that's why he killed children during the Passover. I mean, he wanted people to know how cool he was, or how it wasn't cool to he know how he cool he was. <laughs> it wasn't to know how cool he was, but rather to know the power of his wrath that would be wow. sent upon those who would be in rebellion <laughs> against him. The innocent. Uh, those people okay. did not rebel against him. Those what, people were innocent. By what, by what standard would you consider and state that the people are innocent? In this case, these people were innocent from the punishment. The punishment was because <laughs> Yahweh wasn't getting worship from his people. Yahweh wanted uh, uh, Pharaoh to release them. He wanted Pharaoh to do it. Not the people. Mm -hmm. Not the people mm -hmm. of Egypt. He didn't want the people of Egypt to release his people so they can go worship him in the desert. That's not right. what he wanted. He wanted Pharaoh to do it. So what's he do? He punishes everybody. I don't mm -hmm. think that's quite and the and fair Pharaoh is the represent and Pharaoh is the representative of the entirety of Egypt, and so because of that as the king, and the same thing in regards to the leadership that happens within Israel as well as even 
God being the representative of his chosen people. So what makes that more you sense have... that they had kind of like locust plagues and they had flies because there were dead livestock? All of these things can be explained through natural causes, not with, mm -hmm. and then they're just exaggerated in the Bible. What's more, more, uh, more plausible, the exaggeration mm -hmm. or the, the, the normal story that you know, I would, we would all... I would say in light of the whole entirety of reality, that we have regarding logic and epistemology and all these things, as well as metaphysics, that it, it would have to be the issue of God sending these things in light of <laughs> why the that, Christian worldview. Why does logic dictate God? I'm not saying logic dictates God. I'm okay. saying the fact that we can't even utilize uh, logic without there being a God. That's my whole particular position and argument is that, that like God is the necessary— Right, exactly. God is the necessary <laughs> preconditions for intelligibility. Oh, man. The God of the Bible, Yahweh. This is the yes. one you're talking about. The yes. The guy who, who did the Passover mm -hmm. and the pointless yeah. plagues. Well, you say it's pointless, but you even stated the point of the plagues. Right. He can do all that without killing and torturing people. He could, yes. But he can come down and say, hey, guess what? Of... I'm the most powerful dude. Watch all these magic tricks I can do without mm -hmm. hurting anybody. But Yahweh yes. decides he'd like to hurt people in the process to show how powerful or cool he is. Right, to show the power of his wrath, yeah. Why was he mad? Because Pharaoh wouldn't let his people go. Why wouldn't Pharaoh let his Correct. people go? Because he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Mm -hmm. You're a, you're, you, you believe in free will. You don't believe in free will, right? I don't believe in free will in the sense of the libertarian position. I affirm what would be a compatibilism. That is that we do have the ability to make choices. Choices aren't necessarily uh, autonomous, that there is indeed a causal factor that determines these particular things and i would go with that in my philosophy as god is the one who is the one who determines uh, these particular things so he determined that he was going to harden pharaoh's heart or pharaoh was going to harden his own heart either way it happened both times in the bible so yeah so he knew this was going to happen this was something he planned for is this something you believe yeah i believe so because even romans 9 comments on the fact of going back to the issue of Pharaoh, mm -hmm. and even mentioning the issue before he gets into the uh, the Apostle Paul gets into sort of the rebuttal because in verse seventeen he says, "For the Scripture says," or actually, starting in uh, verse fourteen, "What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have mm -hmm. compassion on whom I have compassion.' So then it depends not on the human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the Scripture says to Pharaoh." For this very purpose, I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Yeah. So, mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. So that his name will be proclaimed in all the earth. Mm hmm. Kind of selfish, don't you think? Depends on what you would define the standard of being selfish in. By what standard? Uh, seeking self gratification? You always see so, self gratification well, all the time, so it's kind of selfish. And and what's the ultimate standard that says that that is what it mean, means to be selfish? Uh, that's the way I'm describing it. So okay, so it's you. So you're the standard for that. At this point in time, during this question, yes. Okay. Because <laughs> we're going to so, look at it as the view that I believe selfishness is. So in okay. my view, that's being selfish. Mm-hmm. Do you not believe and that's being why, selfish? How do you how do you no, define selfishness? I would define selfishness sort of in the same way that you would say it, but I don't think that that would then apply to God because mm -hmm. the issue is that he is uh, divine. We are men. Uh -huh. And so he is not going to be bound by some word. Basically, there's other things that are in either the same category of divine or higher authority that needs to be put oh. into that category. When we think of selfishness, we are thinking in the finite perspective as well as the other humans, because we're not just solo humans. You're not the only human on Earth, and I'm not the only human on Earth. Yeah. Um, so we can know that there is that issue between us and the equality that not only is there a problem there whenever we start to get selfish, and that's problematic, but that then there are higher authorities that that could be a problem for, as well as especially for God. And indeed, the Bible does call, consider God to be a uh, jealous God, so yeah. we do see that in the Bible. Yeah, it's pretty terrible. Do you think jealousy is a good thing? I mean, I think if, you know, I saw someone, if I'm, I'm not married, but I'm just saying if I was, and I saw someone that is trying to 
you know, hmm. convince my wife to cheat on me with someone uh-huh. else, then would you yeah, I would kind of, would I kill him? Yeah. No. No. Mm-mm. Deuteronomy 13, 6 through 11 tells you if your own brother, if your own, the wife you love, which is my favorite part, the wife you love, not that other one. <laughs> if they try and tempt you to worship another god, Deuteronomy tells you to kill him. Mm-hmm. These are Yahweh's ideas. He thinks it's so bad that you, if somebody even tries to get you to worship somebody else, kill mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. This is how serious it is to him. Do you think this is this is Okay. I think regarding that particular covenant that he had with Israel, that, yeah, that was okay thing for them. Why do you think that's okay to kill people who believe other things? During that particular point in time, because God is the standard of which he is allowed to do so. Just because you say he's the standard of something does not make it okay for him to kill people or order the death of people. By what standard? I don't care if it's a goddamn king. You don't get to order people to be and, and, and it, er, to kill people and say it's a good thing automatically. I don't care. But, but that's not. But that's just still that doesn't make the it question. a good thing. Is, that still begs the question: By what standard is it not a good thing? Which one to kill people? In your in your perspective, why is it wrong to kill people? Why is it wrong to kill people? Because it's disadvantageous to the to to a healthy society. Why is it disadvantage or? disengaged, whatever you determined that you used to Why a healthy you society. Think, you think it'd be good just for all of us to go around killing each other? That doesn't no. benefit, that benefit us as, at all. Man, I can talk. <laughs> right, I don't, <laughs> it doesn't benefit I don't think it's us. A good, I don't think it's a good idea either, but okay, my so standard why, is different is than what okay your you... standard is. My so standard that's is, why the question it, is... In a society that's civil, it's not uh-huh. a good idea to do that. That's my standard. I don't, I don't want to live in fear of my neighbor trying to come over and kill me. And I know my, my neighbor doesn't want to live in fear of me trying to come over and kill him. Why, why, was it, why would anybody want to kill anybody anyway? That's a viciously anyways? circular argument, though. That's I a viciously no... circular argument, though, because you're saying it's wrong to kill people in a society because it's wrong to kill people in a society. No, it's because it's not a healthy society. If you're going around killing people, that's spreading fear, that's spreading death. That's not something that's productive. Is that, why, that's not that well, difficult to understand. So why is it not productive to do that, though? Because people will live in fear. Because people will be dead. You won't have okay. uh, uh, con- people contributing to society. You'll have people running in fear in their houses and dying on the street. That doesn't make any sense at all. First, And then why would anybody want to kill anybody? Yahweh wants to kill people that worship other things. That makes no sense. I wouldn't want to kill anybody. I don't care how bad. That, well, maybe there's some people. <laughs> I'm about to no, say, like, I was like, you know, going to bring up the self-defense question there. The self-defense is one thing. That's one. Uh, Yahweh is not self-defense whatsoever. The only self-defense is self-centered. You're going to worship somebody else. Oh, no, you're going to love somebody else. Kill that person who's trying to get you to love somebody else. How ridiculous. Well, again, this is where we are going to have a difference here because we're holding to two different worldviews and two different standards in how we are defining what determines something to be right and what determines something to be wrong. And I think the consistent approach is regarding the issue of the triune God of Scripture being that standard, that ultimate standard, whereas it seems in your good? particular... What makes huh? him this ultimate standard, man? What makes him so good that he's this ultimate standard of good? What did he well, do that's so amazing? It's not that what he does that is amazing okay. to make himself the standard. It is the fact that he is the, sta- he is the standard <laughs> because there is no... <laughs> can, can I finish? powerful he was. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh-huh. He is the ultimate standard because there is no other higher authority that is out there and that thus, doesn't make any result. sense. Why is he the ultimate standard? Because he's the only one out there. That's the dumbest thing. Come on, man. What makes him the ultimate standard? He has to do something or say something or be an actual standard, not just mm-hmm. be there. I'm just well, no, I'm that's so the actual, that, cool. That's, so no, that's the actual, no, that's the actual answer because that's how we engage in epistemological um, questions regarding ultimate standards when it no. comes to trying to evaluate our certain foundational beliefs, such as, for example, the reliability of our senses whenever we're trying to examine if, for example, the uh, bottle of water that I have in my hand, um, how do I know that it's actually real in testing my no, sense? No, how do I know no, that my senses no. are reliable without assuming... How do you know he's good? It? How mm-hmm. do you know he's good? Okay, so how do I know that he is good? So the question, so that for that to be answered, the issue is we go into the scriptures of which he has revealed his word, and in demonstrating so, we see that he is a self-authentication of his good nature. He <laughs> sets the, the standards. I'm the best. 
So that makes can, me the can best. I, can I finish, I said please? So. That's what he did. Okay. You're saying because he said he's the best, he's the best. Mm -hmm. Not just simply because of that. My argument would mostly be within a tri-perspectival argumentation, as Frame would point out. You're, the you're, you're going off of a book that's exaggerated. This is where you're getting your idea of this, right? Not everything in the Bible is exaggerated. Not everything in the Bible is exaggerated. Fine, mm -hmm. not everything in there, but there are some exaggerations in there. You've decided, mm -hmm. you, without verification from your mute, invisible deity, have decided which ones are real and which ones are exaggerated. You have no nope. verification other than that. You weren't there. These words are all we have jumbled, and they're in a million different translations and a million different versions. You have no idea. We have hermeneutics. That's how we can verify. We don't need oh necessarily God, to have the issue of God. You can even translate. Hermeneutics gives you the freedom to interpret it and to, uh, to unriddle the Bible however you please. Not necessarily. There has to be principles in hermeneutics. You can't just go off and make it your own kind at mm. that point. That would be mm. fallacious in terms of that. <laughs> so the issue of how to do hermeneutics, because there's a the thing. This is not just things you are taught in like a Christian thing. Even at Duke University and Yale and Harvard, they will utilize and teach hermeneutics, not just of simply biblical uh, lessons, but of Quranic hermeneutics, of hermeneutics of general classic texts, since we're mm -hmm. talking and dealing with ancient texts that use a different form of literary device and different forms of language that we utilize today. So if we're going to understand what an ancient text is saying, we do need to understand how to utilize these particular hermeneutics, of which some of them can be applied today, in the sense, because we have certain words that if we just go with the straight, literal, wooden, word-for-word, -word, no sense of going for any other way on the meaning, we could yeah. take the second uh, amendment, that is, the right to bear arms. If you just read that without assuming any other different definition for the term, you get the right to bear arms. So everyone gets a – they have the right to get bear arms from a grizzly bear, a black bear. You can go with that. But if we understand the term yeah, bear you, is no. different – So do you believe the moon is a light source? Do I believe the moon is a light source? No, I was actually no, corrected by Aaron Ra on this. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, the Genesis in Genesis it says the moon is a light source. There's more than yeah. one place it says the moon is a light source. So the Bible's inaccurate about that, correct? And I did explain that, yes, because I okay, mentioned so the issue of the flat the Earth. The Bible has inaccuracies. And you're yeah. telling me God is good because it says it's good in a book full of inaccuracies. I wouldn't say it's full of inaccuracies. I know there it's are got some, some inaccuracies. In there. In there. You don't even know how many because you don't know for sure. You can apply your hermeneutics. You can unriddle whatever you want to try and unriddle, but you weren't there. You don't know, and it's full of exaggeration. And yet I've read the Bible. So you believe he's good because he says he's good. Have you seen him do anything? Not just simply because he says he's good. That's part of the issue within the normative okay. perspective of my argument. Then you have the issue of the situational perspective. That is the mm -hmm. facts that we do see established, and we can see that there are things that God does that are no. indeed good. I can't and see then anything there's the God existential, does. Can, can, I, can I finish, please? Well, you're telling and me there's... you can see things God does. That baffles me. Can you see things God does? Yes. There's what? issues of blessings that he has bestowed upon people, and grace, blessings. common grace How do you well. know it was him? How do you know it was huh? not my invisible dinosaur deity? How do you know it was Yahweh specifically? Because if we compare the worldviews of Yahweh, the Christian God, versus your invisible dinosaur, and we try to compare them in regards to reality, we get two things. <laughs> okay. That yours is false and uh, will have to be dependent upon the Christian worldview in order to verify your claims. That's and your that, that's your assumption. That's not how right. reality works. It's though. my it's my presupposition, but without that presupposition, we could not be able to form uh, logical and coherent ideas logical. about reality. Wow! Yeah. So I can't even conform a logical idea without your invisible mute deity sitting up there helping me. Because he has given you those things. That's why the Bible says that all he, men know Oh, God the exists. Bible says. The Bible, the, the exaggerated book. So because the Bible says it happened, it happened. Not just because the Bible says it happened, because that would be vicious circular reasoning. Right. You're telling me these blessings are occurring, but you have no way of verifying that it's your God. He doesn't tell you, hey, by the way, I sent this blessing. Does he? We see that God is sending you blessings upon anything. his people and the word of God, and God promises to send blessings having, upon his people. Living their normal life and good things and bad things happening to him in the same amount it happens to right. everybody else. And good I've, things are part of the common grace and the blessings that people, believers and non-believers, receive. 
what about these Christians that are all dying of COVID? They all pray to their God, save me, save me, save me. Well, God didn't do that one. Why? Because mm-hmm. God has a t- point at a time and a place for all people, including his own people. Hmm. How is he good again? He, he is good again because he is, some people? he is good again because he and is he the stand. So. Oh, you, you keep asking the question, but you're just going to interrupt and cut me off. Yeah, because I know your answer. I'm, I know your answer. How do you know my I'm just answer? Verifying your answer because you've already told how, me. You mm-hmm. believe he's good because he said so in the Bible and because people get and blessings. I was going to go into more of it until you cut Great. me off. So well, apparently yeah, you don't know the fullness of the answer. You don't know the fullness of the answer. Two good reasons. I'd like two reasons you believe are good. Uh, let's get a third one there. Okay, and this right. is where we get into the existential perspective of the triperspectival right. argument regarding this. Triperspectival? One more time. Yeah. What, yes, what tri-pers- triperspectival. This is an argument or a model of it that is formed by John Frame, a philosopher, and this is a sort of epistemological uh, framework on how we view reality regarding uh-huh. the triune God and how it reflects that in a, using epistemology. Uh-huh. I've written an article on this on my quarterly regarding the uh, looking into of this particular method of his. And regarding this, we have, again, the normative perspective, that is, what is the standard or the norms hence the normative, uh, that are established. And the normative perspective is that God is the ultimate standard for what is right and wrong. (laughs) And then you have the situational perspective, which deals with the situations or the facts of reality. And the facts are that there are indeed these blessings that are laid upon the standard that are given and granted upon people in Mm. today's day and age. And then we reach to the existential perspective, which deals more within the experience that humans have. And so in dealing with the intelligibility in our human experience, we see and experience these particular benefits as testimony of this. And so it's not just one particular thing by itself, but rather that each particular perspective or point has to then be verified by the other two in the verification. Huh. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, you have to somehow insert your invisible mute deity there and say it's him. You can't right. just verify it through all of whatever that just was. Right, because the issue is without the truth of God presuppose we cannot account for truth, period. That's the point. <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm just a simple guy. Either your DD comes down and he explains that he's a real person or he's not there. It's pretty simple. I don't understand but, why you got to make it so complicated. Because the Does issue of God is certainly complicated. It's, it's very simple. Very simple. Either he's there or he's not. And he's there. How do you know he's there? Has he come down and said hello? Regarding just simply no. saying hello? Yes. Anything that would be like a, a proof that he exists. Mm-hmm. Anything besides a, an exaggerated book that says he's good. Well, I mentioned the existential perspective, and we can experience that. Then there are people that have experienced that. That doesn't well. point to Yahweh. That, that does not does. point to That does not point to your specific deity. It could be anything. It could be a magical, invisible dinosaur. You have no clue. All, All you right, have so is then a, how do you know about book and feelings? All right, All right, so let's test that then. Your invisible dinosaur. Mm-hmm. Did you say invisible purple dinosaur or invisible dinosaur? Oh no, she is not purple. She okay, not purple. just double checking. Just double checking because I know <laughs> one guy that actually did use that before. Oh my uh, god! Hey, how so, dare they steal my invisible dinosaur idea? <laughs> so regarding, well, he would say say purple, which then begged the question of how okay. he knew that. Um, but then there's the issue of the invisible dinosaur. Then how do you know that regarding the fact that it would be invisible, how would you know that therefore it would be a dinosaur? Logic dictates it would be a dinosaur. Logic dictates it to me, and so does my faith. So the so the dinosaur is subject to logic. Oh, absolutely. And I create that logic that she gives okay. me. I, and I would say that that would be the right there. The fact Why? is that the dinosaur is subject to logic, pointing that logic is a higher authority than the dinosaur, and that you created the logic. Nope, she created that logic point. and gave it that, to me. Oh, so you, and oh, I make so you it and, and you know produce it through through her creation of logic originally and giving it to me. Okay, but if that's the case, have this being subject to logic, are we saying that logic in this view is higher than the dinosaur? She created logic, I said. She's the one that created right. everything. The whole idea of logic only is possible through her. Okay. And so that's your argument, correct? Well, that's my argument against Yahweh. How do you know it's Yahweh? 
Simple, because of the Same. fact that you have yeah, just yeah. proven and demonstrated Scripture to be true at that point. Because, <laughs> again, Where? the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, uh-huh. verses 18 through 20, it says that all men know God exists, but they suppress that truth. And then oh, verse 21 it says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. They became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming mm-hmm. to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. In your particular <laughs> case, the creeping thing or the animal would be the dinosaur. And you basically uh-huh. just giving everything that you just stated that applies to God, you've instead applied it to yeah. what you know within creation. So in other words, you have demonstrated Scripture to be true on the basis no. of Romans chapter 1. No, I've just taken your God and, and replaced it with an invisible dinosaur. That's all like I've one, done. Like Romans 1 says. Oh, for Christ's sake. <clears throat> it, it's to show you how ridiculous it is to claim that it's Yahweh when I can claim mm-hmm. that it's anything else that's you doing could. it. You could. And you, you could, but you would not be able to verify that your logic by itself is rational without borrowing from the Christian Neither world. Neither is you. your. Your logic is not sound either. You're talking to an invisible mute being and thinking it's real. You're telling me he's good because it says he said he's good in a book full of exaggerations and child killings. I mean, so come you say on. mute. You say mute. 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 Like he has no voice. He can't talk. Nothing. Zip. Zero. And how do you know that he cannot talk? Dude. Dude. Have you heard this Dude. guy? Have you heard him? Have He's you heard experienced. Him? He, he has revealed no. himself to me, yeah. No. No. The okay, now, so you is, get to deny. Have you heard him? Have you heard him? Not his voice. No, exactly. He's mute. Not one person has heard him. So he never talked they have, in Exodus. Eh, maybe probably. So he, never, he never ta- he, so he never spoke in the Bible. You're saying that. He's never spoken the Bible. You're telling me Yahweh spoke the Bible? Spoke thought, in the Bible. Spoke in the Bible. Oh, yeah, that's, that's yeah, part you of have the exaggeration, text. buddy. That's where that how comes do you know in. That it's a, how do you hermeneutically know that that is meaning an exaggeration? Logic. Basic logic. reason and logic. Voices don't come out of the sky. Is, Bushes don't okay. burn and talk to people. Animals is, don't talk. This is, is logic, logic and ob- reason. Is logic objective or subjective? I don't know. See, this is where the so you don't conversation know? always lose. I always lose this subjective, objective. You know what? I don't know. All I know so, is it's bad to kill kids. And you but you don't know, though. But you don't know that point because if you're going to no, suggest that I don't understand the whole concept of subjective versus uh, objective. Me, objective myself, means universal. Uh-huh. Objective means universal, meaning regardless of what you yeah. state, it will be true regardless. Subjective means it is truth that is opinion-based, meaning that it is only true for that particular person. Like I had a conversation with someone in Arkansas, and he suggested that truth and morality is completely subjective. It only depends upon the individual to determine what's right for them and what's wrong for them. They don't get to impose yeah. their idea of right or wrong on somebody else. And he was even willing to say then when I asked him, what about rape? He's like, well, to the rapist, it's not wrong for him to rape. And no, see, that, that's the problem is what I go with is the, what's good for the whole. What's good as a society as a whole? What's going to benefit us? What's going to push us forward to do better? And that was still subjective. Is that what that is, subjective? Yes, because even if you're referring to the issue of society as a whole, that still is a consensus upon subjective Whatever. opinion. But in a gathering, Whatever it is, view. that's how I believe. I believe killing children, mass murder through floods, and and and. St- uh, whatever it was, uh, the Passover. I think all of that's terrible. I think it's a terrible idea because it's not beneficial to society as a whole. So subjective, whatever the hell it is. Right, right. That's so you're just it saying is, it's then. in your own opinion this wouldn't be a benefit. Would you think it's a benefit to kill kids? No, and I can say it's not. Why? Why would you say it's not that? Because we have an objective standard, and well, that is through God that we have that objective Yahweh standard. Yahweh kills kids, so how the hell are we taking him for a standard? Because the issue is that God has the right to do so, but human beings who are subjected to the law are not allowed to do so. Because God has the right to give life and to take life. That makes him a monster. By what objective standard? The society one I just went over. It's not beneficial to society to kill or drown babies or starve them to death like he does. But you said— Unless that's exaggerated. But you just said that it's— Entire, that's your opinion in which the issue of the society goes you because just we just go with the society kids, so it's our because opinion. if we just go with the society um, approach then according to that 
then Germany was justified in what they're doing because of the collective That's the society. Thing. That's the, the collective thing. I never society. Said that shit. The collective society has gathered and done this thing. It was not beneficial to a society as a whole. It was not beneficial to the human race, man. That was some ooh, woo. Yeah, that was it, some stuff. It, it but, was dark, and you can say it's dark because of the law that has been given to you by God. No, of the God you no, know exists. No, a documented child killer is not telling me not to kill people. That's dumb. That doesn't make any sense. Oh yeah, I can do it, but you can't. Oh, watch this baby over here. Watch me drown him. Yeah, his parents weren't listening. Exodus 25, you know? Mm -hmm. Exodus 25. Punishment for the children. <laughs> no! That's horrible! That's not a standard of... That's a standard of being a monster. The superhero doesn't come in and drown kids. That's not what you look up to. That's not a father figure. That's a monster. To you. To you? Is it to you? Do you think that's great? Do you think it's a good idea to drown kids because their parents aren't listening? They weren't just simply listening. They were in complete active rebellion. Oh, my God. God. They were rebellious. How dare yeah. they drown their kids? Mm -hmm. Look at that infant over there. Watch him suffer. Oh, see that giraffe? He can't keep his head above water much longer. <laughs> there he goes. Wrath. Oh, I'm so mad at you. That's a monster, man. That's not a standard of anything. Anything right, but good. based on what you have just stated, it is your subjective opinion in which you are making and that particular yours. thing and yours itself. Yours what if well. some you're against the killing of kids, you told me. Against the killing of kids from human beings to murder and slaughter any innocent oh, so okay. human beings. You're okay with Yahweh killing kids, it's no big deal. I it's literally good. just said that regarding the issue that he has created life and he has the right, right. to but take away. But you have away to like say it. I want to created. hear you say that you have no problem with Yahweh drowning and starving children. Regarding the issue that he does have that right. I've said it three times at least on this podcast. You have not said the words. I, I have no problem with Yahweh there are starving ways. or drowning children. There are various ways to say it, and I'm not going to entertain your idea to decide to just simply mock God because you can't justify mock your God. worldview, your own ideas. Oh, man, I'm thinking of... <laughs> not mocking God. That's you certainly funny. have been. Interesting. I'm mocking. I'm not mocking anything, really. I'm just trying to explain the uh, how this works for you because it's so frustrating. It doesn't make any sense at all. Why doesn't it make <clears> sense? I just what I just said. I went over the whole thing. Why it doesn't make any sense to me? Mm -hmm. So let's try and go back to why he's good. Let's try and go back to that. We've got our first two reasons. Our third reason was. Um, ridiculous as well they're not all unique individual this, reasons they're part of the single reason that he's good i mean like we're going back to the whole killing kids here he kills children he kills regular people in the, in the end he's going to set fire to the whole world and send everybody to hell do you believe in hell yeah i believe in hell okay so and this i don't is think all he's gonna happen, but he's still the hell. good guy he's, he's still the sending, good guy for some he's reason he's not sending everyone to hell he's not sending everyone who created hell who created hell who created hell I would establish that that would probably be God that created probably hell. Probably Yahweh. Why would he create hell? As a place for punishment. As a place for eternal punishment. Correct. So he did this on purpose, and yes. he knows what's going to happen, right? He, he's got his plan mm -hmm. set in motion, so he knows exactly who's going to go to hell and who's not going to go to hell right off the bat, right? Mm -hmm. So he created this for those people. Mm -hmm. Again, that's not good. Why not, I love this one, an eternal couch where you just sit on this couch for a timeout period of years. Oh, there's your timeout. Instead of an eternal punishment by being burned by fire just because you don't believe or love in this guy. Again, not a good thing. And then let's go to heaven. Heaven. Do you think heaven is a good thing? I do think so. Heaven is going to be miserable. You're, according to the Bible, you're going to have his name written on your forehead. There's not going to be any nighttime whatsoever, and you're going to sing praises and be his servant. That is a miserable time. For eternity. So both places sound like a different kind of torture to me. Not really good. I'm still not seeing the good here. Right, you might not see the good, and that is again because you were deciding to be in your rebellious. I'm so rebellious. Yeah. Rah. What's he going to do? From the conversation. He's going to send me to a place of fire to burn forever. Not a place of fire, a place of darkness. Whatever the hell it is. Do you think it's a good thing to send me there? Because to I don't believe because I'm rebellious? 
to punish people who have violated his law. Do you yes. think it's a good idea to say I literally me there just said it. Had you not interrupted me, you would have heard I said you yes. You said people. As soon as you... Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. So you Had believe people. that I deserve this punishment? Because you have broken his law. Yes. <laughs> we all deserve it. I deserve to be there. Yes. Uh, man, dude, I'm just still not seeing any good here. You have yet to tell me anything that's good, except for your strange belief because the Bible says so when people get blessings. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. That doesn't justify any of this. So you don't believe there is any good in the Bible? Oh, I'm sure, you know, love your neighbor, you know, stuff like that. I'm talking about everything else where Jesus tells you to drink okay. poison, stone disobedient children, he hell, doesn't you to drink heaven. Poison. He doesn't command uh, you to drink poison. He doesn't command you to, but he tells you to. He tells you can. Drink poison. Great. Go ahead. Where does he say that? Fine. It's in Mark. Okay, first of all, we're going to go over two things here. Oh, uh, number two, uh -huh. depending on who you talk to, because there's the other thing to consider. Number one, mm -hmm. most scholars do not even consider this to be authentic. Are you a due to the No, but I know several believe scholars. what they believe? I believe in what they affirm and based on the fact that so the two men... That let me, can you are you going to let me finish or not? Are you going to let me finish or not? That wasn't a part of the original Mark. I know where you're going, so I want to know. Do I you believe that's that a part is. of Mark or not? I would, and hence okay. why number two, if you have let me finish, mm -hmm. number two, the command doesn't say that you are to go and just drink poison. The point yeah, of it can't. is, in the, in the let me finish, in the Greek... It is stating, if you do drink it, you will not be harmed in the sense of which we see it happen in the New Testament when the apostles have been bitten by snakes, yeah, but real and life. they aren't affected by We're the poison. And then there's the punishment of John before he is sent to the island to then eventually Again, compose Revelation. Real he, life, is man. Fed, he is fed poison, and he ends up surviving, and thus the only punishment they had was to send him to die on an island. That's a cool story, bro, but that's not what I asked. Uh -huh. So, and then even, well, we're going to go with snakes. I love that one, too. Snakes, it doesn't even say deadly serpents anywhere in there. It doesn't even oh. say it has to be a deadly serpent. It just says hold snakes. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't even say you have to sing or dance. Those snake-holding preachers, you, do you agree with that? Are you okay with that? I'm not okay with the Pentecostal teaching today regarding it because it is a misinterpretation of a text. Huh. So you, you agree it doesn't say deadly snakes anywhere in there? Says they pick up serpents with their hands. Right, serpents with their hands. No deadly, no poison, no nothing. Doesn't say any of that stuff in there. So you're you're telling me because they got bit by snakes later on, it was okay. Well, great, that's fine. They drink deadly poison again. That's great, that's fine. These are all stories in the Bible. It right, doesn't happen grab, in real life. They didn't, grab, they didn't grab a bit of poison and try to then get it upon they them. They were poisoned. Whatever, dude. Yes. It doesn't happen in it, real life. It did with John, as as that's the not historical. Real life. That is because it is a historical the document. The Bible doesn't count as real life. It's full of exaggerations. How are you supposed the to Bible know The Bible doesn't true? talk about the poisoning of John. The Bible well, nowhere does? mentions it. Who does then? There's a particular historical document out there. I'm going to have to go catch it out. But the issue is that we don't Man. even see that regarding the issue of Peter who was crucified upside down. Mm. Hence, the upside down cru crucifix was originally a Christian symbol used by the early church to show humility. Because we see this within the martyrdom of Peter of where we know of how he was crucified. Not even on the same topic. The point is that we're not just going to the Bible to get our information on reality and history. No. You think I'm somehow limited? You think somehow I'm just? Li you think I'm somehow just limited to the Bible for no, anything? No, 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 absolutely not. I don't think you are. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, if you One of your comments. <laughs> oh no, 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 no. All right, so he's he's good because you you think he's good and stuff. Because he has done things that are good, you Nothing. would agree to. No. You, Where? What you literally you just good? said there are some things in the Bible regarding the issue of saving people and telling people to love no. thy neighbor as themselves. I said loving each other by yourself. I think that's a good idea. That's a good idea. That's not something good that he did. Oh, my huh. God. I can look at any other kind of self-help book and find to love my neighbor. I don't right. need Yahweh, a child killer, to tell me to love my neighbor. So let man. me say this. You then. can throw all that crap out and just go get yourself a self-help book that doesn't have child killing in it. Right. Let's go with this then. <laughs> if, is it okay that if someone has the ability to just simply leave people in Egypt as slaves, do you think that if a person could oh, and they mm. were able to rescue slaves, do you think that's a good thing? To rescue slaves? Yeah, yes. I think slavery is a bad thing, unlike your Can you just deity. answer the question? Is it a good thing said, to rescue slaves, yes or no? 
rescue slaves. Good thing to rescue slaves. Um, yes, I think it's a good thing to rescue slaves. And that is what we see in the Exodus account with Yahweh rescuing the yeah, you slaves. You don't even think it's real. You think it could be a few people. But Ooh, the point is that there people. is an exodus. The point so is that what? there is an exodus. How many people have saved slaves? The you point want all is of that... them to be deified as well? We're not saying deify every single individual people. The point is that you said rescuing slaves is good. Yahweh rescued slaves. Therefore, Yahweh is good true. by your own logic. You don't even know if it's true, though. I don't you even do think know that it. it's true. I don't even think he did it. And the reason, and and to accomplish this, what did he do? He killed children in their sleep, mm -hmm. innocent kids. For what reason? To show off how how awesome he is. To show off his powers. Look how cool I am. Look what I can do. I can kill kids in their sleep. Worship me. Praise me. Look, I rescued a few slaves. Aren't I good? This yeah, is how I'm looking at it, man. This is how I see it. This mocking of yours is definitely quite entertaining for me. This is how I see it. I know that's how you see it. It's not good. I don't see that as good. Right, I don't see. <clears throat> then, he, then later on, he condones slavery. God is good. He tells you you can beat your slave. He tell that was it, Exodus twenty one. He tells you you can beat your slave, and if they don't die in the third day, then you're all good. Go ahead, beat your slave. That's disgusting. It doesn't say. Then he tells you, you how to sell your daughter. It doesn't how say. To sell your daughter. one at a time. I'm just telling so, you, it condones slavery, man. Well, you're getting things where apparently your lack of knowledge of the Hebrew text does not allow it. you to interpret the text properly. Tell me. Because Tell there me. is a there's a friend of mine, Tyler Vela, you mm -hmm. should get a chance to listen to because he has debated Aaron Ra on this particular topic regarding the issue of slavery and mm -hmm. has posted videos and blog article regarding the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It is not trying to tell you that you have the permission to beat your slave up as much as you want. It is regarding certain limitations on which this is able to be done. Yeah, right, exactly. You're allowed to do it. Yahweh allows you to beat your slave. In, in the issue of this context of a particular set of a punishment, <laughs> not just, oh, I'm feeling like I just need to let my right. aggression that out of the slave. Matter. You're not nowhere helping Nowhere does case. it say you have the ability to just, oh, I'm bored, <laughs> punch the slave. You don't have the right to do that according to the Holy biblical text. Cow. Holy cow, you're missing the whole point. You're missing it altogether. Apparently, Yahweh, you keep going all over Yahweh the place. is allowing you to beat your slave. He says it's okay if you do it. Mm -hmm. He's not telling you to do it. He's not saying do it because you want to do it. I don't give a crap if it's under a punishment or not. It's still disgusting. That slave didn't pick up that trash. You're allowed to beat him. Yahweh said so. That's disgusting. That's terrible. Ephesians 6, 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear okay. and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Slaves, obey your masters. Do it. Don't, don't flee from them. Don't get rescued. Obey your masters. Mm -hmm. Disgusting. You're telling me it's good because he saved a few slaves from Egypt, if he even did no. that. No, I'm pointing out the issue. You said God did absolutely nothing good, and if that's the case, you think freeing slaves is not a good thing. Otherwise, your argument is refuted. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel about slavery in the Bible? You think it's an okay thing because, you know, it was a different kind of slavery? Which one? We're talking about the issue of different types All of context. All the slaves in the Bible. Every slave in the Bible that it that it's talking about here. The quote-unquote slavery in the Old Testament is different than the Greco-Roman context oh, in the New Testament. Is. If you, you look, if you know okay? history, then you would know this. I don't give a crap, man. It's slavery. Do so you, you don't care okay? about history. I understand. Do you think it's okay in any context? Slavery. If you have to pay off a debt, do you think slavery is a good idea? Any context at all? Owning another human <laughs> being. Do you think this is a great idea? Indentured servitude, I have no problem with the Old Disgusting. Testament laws of it. Okay, well, you have that. Disgusting. Okay. Terrible, man. All right. Well, I, I can't <laughs> go any further with that. That's horrible. All right. By well, your opinion. <laughs> most people. Most people, buddy. <laughs> right. Most people. That's okay. but then is that what determines right or wrong, what most people say? Oh, no, we've already established that one. Oh, like, well, apparently I'm sub subjective? Am I subjective? Yeah, right? subjective. And even yeah. that, what you just stated, is still subjective, saying what most people say. And by that logic, if most people five years from now— to a society, dude. Holy crap, what you're missing what that determines, point. Why are you what keep determines, what determines, pushing that point that, out? What determines objective or subjective beneficial for society? What ultimately determines that? 
if the ben, if the society thrives and everybody's happy and healthy, okay, and the, and the planet's good, and the animals are great. Guess what? It's beneficial. Okay, it's not gonna be it's not gonna be great uh, uh, black and white every time. There's gonna be gray areas, of course. That's mm -hmm. how it works. Uh huh. But in a general rule that Yahweh does not use, apparently, the benefit to a society keeping people safe, happy, and healthy. Mm -hmm. Is a main is a good goal. Is a good idea. Is a good way to look at things. It's a good way to determine if it's going to be a good idea or not. Mm -hmm. But Yahweh is completely different than that man. The God you worship, mm -hmm. totally different. So subjective, but with limit or with um, details, different details, I guess. I don't know. Subjective, objective. Thanks for helping me. Uh, um, Work through that. I appreciate that. I've always had. I've always struggled with that subjective or objective sh shenanigans. Yeah. But yeah. All right. Well, we're, we've ended it. I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, um, and your your uh, your rebuttals and your answers and um, uh, your passion. No problem. All right. Well, we'll talk to you later, and uh, you have yourself a great day. Will do. Thank you. Bye. That's all the podcast there is for you today. Thanks for listening. I'm pleased to announce that the show has its very first Love Me Three Times patron, Melissa Cummings. Thank you, Melissa, for the extra love and support. You, too, can be immortalized in BSW history. Stop by patreon.com forward slash BSW the podcast and sign up to be a supporter of the show. For as little as a dollar an episode, patrons get access to extra content such as bloopers and unaired conversations. You can also support the show by sharing, subscribing, or leaving a review. I love hearing feedback from listeners. Stop by and say hello at the Bible Says What Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or Instagram pages. You can also reach me at bswthepodcast at gmail.com. And no matter which platform you use to listen to your podcasts, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you won't miss out on the next episode. Until then, would you kindly pick up your Bibles and read them? made it to the easter egg now you get free stickers send your address to bsw the podcast at gmail.com and i'll send you some free bsw stickers okay bye now see ya see you next time <laughs>